Good morning, church family. It is my pleasure to be with you this Sabbath, and I know I've been blessed so far. I feel like it's been a whole service already, and I haven't even, haven't even opened the Word. I mean, the Word's been opened, but, you know, we haven't gotten to the sermon time. So I've been blessed, the baptism, the everything's been a blessing. And uh, I know the time is already 1144, so I'm going to pray and go ahead and jump into the Word again, just just a pleasure to be here with you all. I was able to meet a few of, a few of you all before the, uh, before the worship time, but uh, looking forward to meet more of you. And, and as Pastor Keating said, just seeking God's will. We just want his will, his way, and uh, know that he can make that clear. So I'm just going to kneel one more time as we pray, one more time to ask the Holy Spirit to be with us. And um, you're welcome to kneel. You don't have to, but I'm going to kneel. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this beautiful Sabbath morning, uh, an opportunity to fellowship one with another, spend time one with another, and specifically in your word. Lord, we're praying that your Holy Spirit enlightens our mind. Lord, I pray that I'm hid behind the cross, that my voice, my words would not be heard, but your voice and your words, because Lord, as you are lifted up, you draw all men. So this is our this is our prayer. We thank you for this time, and we give it to you. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so starting off, I have a, uh, a story I'd like to share, and hopefully the pictures can uh, be shown on the screen. Have you all ever been anxious? Has anybody ever been anxious before? Had a little anxiety? You know, I think all of us at some point in life have had this, and this actually, this story is, is I wanted to give for the kids, a time when um, I have some pet ducks. I've, I'm an animal lover. I enjoy uh, critters, and when I was in high school, I had ducks, and even some in college, but uh, there was a time when one of my ducks decided to lay her eggs in a very bad spot. It was in kind of a gully. It would be washed out, and so I said, well, I better try to save these eggs, and uh, so she'd been sitting on them for a few days. Anyways, I went and gathered the eggs. Obviously, the mother was not happy, but uh, the process of incubating those eggs, that definitely was a, gave me a little anxiety. Now, I don't know if any of you have uh, hatched duck eggs or chicken eggs, but duck eggs, you have to spray daily. This is the little incubator we had. You have to spray them with water daily, and you have to turn them around. You have to flip them because the babies can... Uh, can develop wrongly. And so every day I had to spray them, I had to flip them, and uh, it, was, it was a little chore, um, a little chore. And I just remember, you can actually put a light on an egg, put a flashlight, and you can see the little embryo starting to form. And that was very interesting to see. And, and during the whole time, you're just, you're wanting to keep the, the, the temperature correct. You're trying to keep, make sure they have enough water. There's so many different things you're trying to keep track of. And there's a little life in there. And I'm like, mercy, I don't want to kill these. Because if, if, if it's too hot, you'll cook them. And if it's too cold, they'll die. So uh, you're kind of stuck in the middle there. So it was a, a slightly uh, anxious, anxious happening. But as uh, I continued, I remember thinking, I think I'm too anxious about this. I need to trust God with it. Sometimes we take things on ourselves that we really need to trust God with these things. If you want to go to the next picture, um, this is the result um, I think 11, so there was 12 eggs, and 11 of them hatched, one was not fertile. And so God, yeah, all 11 of those little tiny ducks hatched, and it was just cool to see, and how I really didn't need to be anxious. Sometimes we take things on ourselves, and we, we hold all this anxiety, but we don't need to do that. And obviously this is just a, a, in the natural world, you know, something that doesn't have a whole lot of import, but yet I think, it, I think there are things we can learn um, in regards to anxiety. And then those little guys, they love to sit in your hand. There they were in my hand. Um, and they, they grew up and they flew the coop and they're doing their own thing now. But I wanted to start with that story because uh, anxiety and being anxious and dealing with these things are, I think, something that all of us deal with. You know, in this last two years, I hate to mention it, but COVID and all, I think that's caused some anxiety over, you know, some situations. And there's a lot involved with that. But you know, you have, you have financial things that sometimes, you know, just talking about different things that gives us anxiety. Sometimes finances uh, cause 
cause maybe uh, anxiety or thinking about the gas prices rising. You know, so many things that can, that can really mess with our minds and get us anxious in some way or another. It might be your utilities or electric costs. Those are on the rise. I mean, so many things are in this day and, this day and age are things that we can get anxious about. And you know, one thing I was thinking about, the more stuff you have, the more anxiety you can have. Have you noticed that? The more things you have, the more things you have to worry about. So sometimes getting one more thing that you might think might be the best thing really might be not what you really need. So point being, a lot of things, even health. Sometimes our family or friends um, might be in a health crisis. That can give anxiety. That can give uh, worry. And then for maybe high schoolers or those in school and college or high school or whatever, maybe your grades, maybe your uh, career, you know, many things that we can be anxious about. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about the Bible and what the Bible has to say about anxiety, how to deal with these things. Um, I'll be sharing more of kind of my story and some things that have been happening in my life. But I want to jump to to uh, Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to start in verse 25. And um, again, we're talking about worry. We're talking about how to deal with anxiety and what, what Jesus says to us. Again, we're in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 25. We're going to jump into the word here and it says this. Therefore, I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? So this is Jesus speaking. He's saying, listen, we don't need to worry. He continues, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in barns, yet our heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? In verse 27, which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto his stature? Verse 28, and why take ye thought of raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. Verse 29 says, and, they, and yet I say unto you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Verse 30, wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? And verse 31, and therefore, take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or, what, or whither, wherewithal shall we be clothed? And verse 32 says this, for after all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your Father in heaven knoweth that you need all of these things. So we have Jesus saying, listen, I know you need clothes. I know you need a place to stay. I know you need all these things. But if you let that become the worry of your life, it'll take over. And then you won't be able to focus on, on Jesus. And then we have this powerful promise verse that just jumps out to us here. Verse 33. Can you all read it with me? Verse 33, and we'll read it on the count of three. One, two, three. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Powerful verse. Powerful verse. It's one that we quote. We talk about, oh, yeah, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to, uh, unto you. We just, you know, we kind of throw it out there. If somebody's going through something or, you know, we're worried about something, we just throw it out there. But as... I was pondering this verse. I'll be honest with you. The last few weeks, there have been some things that the Lord has been teaching me trust. Teaching me trust in God where some things have come and I'm like, Lord, what is going on? How is this happening? And he's seeking to teach me trust. And I want to I show you something that is very interesting that, that he brought to me in studying what this verse is because by God's grace, I want to seek the kingdom of God with all my heart. I want to seek his righteousness and the beauty of that is when we do that, everything else comes with that. But if we're seeking him to get everything else, it doesn't work. You, you see what I'm saying? It's, it's when we're seeking him and we're seeking his righteousness that everything else comes. So a little bit about this. So when you have the story of, uh, or you have the passage here of Matthew 6, 
And he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. The kingdom of God first jumped out to me. So I, I, I figured, well, I should study what the kingdom of God is, right? You know, how can I, if I'm supposed to seek the kingdom of God first, what is this kingdom of God, right? And so in Matthew, there are 32 times where the scripture uses the word the kingdom of heaven. Now, obviously, in this verse, it's saying the kingdom of God, but a very similar idea. And that is in connection with, uh, it says the kingdom of heaven is like the sower, like the leaven, like the treasure, like the net. A lot of different stories there. But I, I, I kept digging and um, I searched specifically the word the kingdom of God because that's what's used in that, in that passage. It says the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And so as I started to go through the, the gospels, um, there's actually 54 times where the word kingdom of God is used or that phrase in the gospels. But as, as, I, as, I, as I went through the different uh, occurrences of it, there was one or two that really jumped out at me. And I'm just, uh, and I'm looking forward to sharing those with you. There's two different places. It's Luke 18, 16, and 17, but I want to go to the one in Mark. Mark chapter 10 and verse 13. If you all would turn with me there, Mark chapter 10. So again, we're looking at what is this kingdom of God? What does this have to do with our lives? Mark 10 and verse 13. If you would turn there with me, Mark 10 and verse 13. The scripture reads this. So again, we're looking at the kingdom of God. What is the kingdom of God? Verse 13, it reads, And they brought young children to him that he should teach them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. And then we have this very interesting verse, verse 14. Again, we're in, if you haven't not there already, we're in Mark chapter 10, verse 14. It says this, but Jesus saw it. He was much displeased. So again, they're bringing the children to Jesus. Jesus loves children. He loves children so much. He loves us all, but I think there's a special place in his heart for those, those children. So that was wonderful to see the baby dedication today, the baptism, and then all the kids up here for, uh, for the children's story. Jesus loves children and uh, he says this, But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased and said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for, forbid, wait, 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 oh yeah, and forbid them not, for such is the kingdom of God. Such is the kingdom of God. And that hit me as I read that. That word such is, is, is in the original. Um, let's see if I can get exactly what what the uh, word is in the original. Um, it is such as this or of this sort. So it's saying the children um, and forbid them not for such is the kingdom of heaven. So basically they have the kingdom of heaven. So I said, well, interesting. If there's a group of people and specifically children that have the kingdom of heaven, what are their, uh, what are the characteristics or how can we have the kingdom of heaven? Because he's saying here that they have it. So I'm like, Lord, how can we get the kingdom of heaven? How can we seek the kingdom of heaven? And as I was, like I said, you know, I've been going through some things in, in, in life that have been challenging, that have really made me question, you know, Lord, are you leading? How, you know, what's going on in, in, in this situation? But as I, as I was studying this verse, or, or I should say um, Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. This is what jumped out to me. Because I realized that the children have the kingdom of God. Let's talk about children a little bit. Now, are children worried about many things? Not really, right? I remember when my brother uh, was about, he's 10 years un- younger than me. And you can put the picture of my family up on the screen if, uh, if it's there. But uh, my brother, 10 years younger than me, so I was able to watch him grow up. And um, I remember asking him at one point, I asked him, so, uh, so Michael, you know, what's, you got any struggles or any problems in, in your life? You know, is there anything we should talk about? And he's like, uh, no. And uh, at that point, I think he was learning to tie a shoe or something like that. And I said, what, is that probably your main struggle right now, tying your shoe? He's like, yeah, probably. You know, and it's just that innocence that, you know, they're not anxious. They, they're not really worried about the next meal or, or what's going to happen the next day. I mean, sometimes the kid might be like, when, I'm, when am I going to eat? But they're not worried, am I going to eat, you know? And just the Lord started speaking into my, in, into my mind, seeking first the kingdom of God is having a trust, the trust of a child in Jesus. 
is getting to the point in our lives where it doesn't matter what the, what the circumstances are, what the problems are going on in our life, that we're just simply trusting our Father in heaven. And I want to say something on that. Our fa- uh, speaking about fathers, happy Father's Day to all you fathers out there. My dad isn't watching right now. He'll probably watch it later. He's uh, at church at the moment uh, listening to my brother-in-law uh, preaching. But yeah, happy Father's Day to my dad whenever he watches this. Um, if it weren't for my dad, my dad has been a solid rock for my family, and I am so thankful for him, the, the example of faith. Um, as you can probably see in the picture, uh, my mother has a trach, and she drives a little wheelchair. Um, about 2019, started having some speech impediment and wondering what that was. Long story short, uh, we found out that she had Lou Gehrig's disease, ALS, which uh, for those that know what that is, uh, it's, it can be challenging. And uh, it has been a journey of faith for my family, but seeing my dad trusting Jesus in this time has been very impactful. So I'm thankful for, for my dad. And uh, the fact that we can trust a loving God that, that cares for us, that is so good. And I just have a little praise. God, ha- so she got a trach about two weeks ago. Uh, that's when they go in through the throat and then they're able to... Uh, get your airway because her lungs didn't have the capacity and strength to breathe correctly. So anyway, she got the trach and she was really low energy before that. But since that time, uh, she's been gaining her energy back. So we're really praising God um, for that. But again, to say, trust, trust. That is what God is calling us to do, to trust him when everything does, it isn't perfect, when everything isn't uh, okay. You know, I was thinking, isn't it so easy to say God is good when everything is going fine? Have you noticed that? We say, man, God is good. You know, let's say something, you know, God provides you a home or whatever it may be, whatever that good thing is. We say, man, God is good. How many times in those serious trials, I don't know, I'm sure some of you may have lost family members recently or, or I don't know, other things in our lives that are seriously challenging. How many times in those challenges do we, do we, the first thing that comes to mind is God is good. But friends, God is good no matter what the things are going on in our life. He is truly good. Makes me think of Job. Job, man, he had all types of things going on to him. But he said, yea, though you slay me, yet will I love him. Yet will I stay with God. And that's the trust I believe that God is seeking to, to help us, help us with that, that humility, that trust, that, uh, isn't connected with the circumstances, isn't connected with uh, the happenings uh, directly with our life. You know, there's a story, there's a picture of uh, the beautiful place, Crystal, Colorado. Um, My family had the opportunity of going there. um, When we were young, we actually ended up kind of hiking in, long story short, and as we were hiking in uh, to this beautiful place, my, uh, I think it was about five miles or so. We had our bikes, and anyways, we, we, were, we were hiking in there. And, and my dad, uh, we would ask my dad, how, how long before we, we get there? Uh, you know, how, how soon before we're there? And uh, at first he would try to calculate, you know, I think we're about three quarters of the way, or, you know, a half or two thirds. And, and we would be like, oh, dad, is it still that far? And then it got to the point where he just would say, children, we're almost there. We're almost there. And that was enough for us. Every time we'd ask, he'd say, we're almost there. We're almost there. And that was enough for us. And I think that type of trust is what we need to have in our loving Savior. Now, another thing. So ALS, um, it definitely stands for something. I'm not going to get into that. But Lou Gehrig's disease is the, is the acronym for it. But we changed that. Our family, we have a different name for that. We call it a loving savior, ALS. We, have, we all have ALS. We all have a loving savior. And uh, it's, been, it's been a journey. But again, this trust, this is what Jesus was speaking to me as I was reading this. Um, another version says this, uh, Mark 10, this is ESV, it says this, but when Jesus saw it, he was indignant, this is talking about with the, the children and, and them trying to send them, send them away. And he said unto them, let the little children come unto me and do not hinder them, for such belongs the kingdom of God. And it's this trust. It's this not having to know all the issues, all the, all the problems, just trusting God is what this seeking the kingdom is, is seeking to trust them. And you know another thing, well that went flying, um, another thing that 
I realize in this is it's hard to trust somebody you don't know. It's hard to trust somebody you don't know. When we don't know God, we don't trust him. I remember one of my students, I deaned at a high school for a, a, a time, and that was a wonderful experience. One of my students in a Sabbath school, they were mentioning how God, no, no, not God, sometimes we picture God as a vending machine. We go to God, we pray, we say, Lord, I need this, I need that. Okay, let me get it. But how that's not what the, the, the spiritual walk is about. It, God is not just a vending machine that whenever we need something, we go to him and it's like, God, I prayed and now I should get it. No, God, uh, the, the relationship with God, it's, it's relational. It's not just when things are going wrong or when things are going right that we go to him. It's a moment-by-moment moment experience, and that's the only way we can truly trust Him in whatever's going on in our lives, in the difficult times and in the good times. And again, the last few weeks, the Lord has been taking me on a journey of teaching me to simply trust Him, even when I don't understand, when I don't know what's going on, to simply trust Jesus. Now, I, I kind of want to go to the next part. I want to say one thing about doubt. Um, this is a very interesting uh, quote here from, it is, it is from, let's see if I can find where the, looks like it cut it off halfway, there it is. All right, yes. Ministry of Healing at 474.1, it says this. In the future life, the mysteries that here have annoyed and disappointed us will be made plain. We shall see that our seemingly unanswered prayers and our disappointed hopes have been among our greatest blessings. Has there ever been something in your life that you've just been praying for? Like, Lord, please help the situation. And somehow it doesn't work out the way that you think it should. But we, we can trust a God that in the end, we're going to be able to say, Lord, you did right. I can trust you with that. And I think it's important for us to, to realize that in the end, it might not make sense in this time, but one day we'll be able to say, God, you are good and you truly are, are trustworthy. I want to talk a little bit about um, the seeking of righteousness. Um, that's a, obviously another part of, of uh, Matthew six thirty three. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. I want to jump over to James chapter 2. So I was, I was kind of going and doing a search in the scriptures in regards to righteousness. And uh, James chapter 2, and we're going to go to verse 22. James chapter 2 and verse 22, if you want to follow along with me there. And uh, there's a beautiful kind of story, or it reminds us of a, of a story in the uh, Old Testament. Again, James chapter 2, and uh, we're going to look at verse 22. And this is what it reads. It says this. So we're talking about righteousness. So first we're talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. And one thing that we find that that is, is a simple trust in God. And that only comes after a relationship with our God and Father Jesus Christ. So again, now we're talking about righteousness, seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And this is what it says, verse 22. Seest thou how faith wrought with his work? So this is, well, let's jump to verse 21. It says this. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Seest thou how faith wrought with his works by works was faith made perfect. So speaking about the experience of Abraham, where he was asked by God to offer his son on an altar, which that would pose so many questions in my mind, that takes a serious amount of trust that God's going to work out the situation because we know that he was given Isaac as a promise to be the, the father of many nations. And so his mind is like, how does this make sense? This does not make, you know, how does this make sense? But he was a friend of God, and that's what gave him the, the trust in God to do what God called him to do, even though it didn't make sense. And, and the verse continues, verse 23. And the scriptures was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. So we see here, again, this, this righteousness, the way he got the righteousness was believing in God. 
And that wasn't just believing in God when God was, when everything was going great and everything was understandable and God is good and all this. This is believing God when it didn't make sense. He's like, what is happening here? And then specifically, specifically the latter part of this verse says this. And he was called the friend of God. The friend of God. You see, friends, what it takes is being in a, an intentional relationship and friendship with God. You know, I was thinking about uh, when we try to get our own righteousness, it's almost like this. Seeking righteousness aside from Jesus is like a pig trying to clean the mud off himself in a mud hole. It doesn't work. You can't get clean without that relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think as Christians, there's going to be difficult times ahead of us. There's going to be times when, when we won't be able to understand what's going on. We'll just have to simply trust in Jesus. Simply trust in Jesus. But it takes this relationship. It takes this relationship. I want to go to uh, uh, one more um, passage with you that has been a real treasure in my life, and it's Psalm 61, speaking about uh, when these trials, when these difficulties come, what to do. Uh, this is Psalm 61. If you would turn there with me, um, that would be great. 61, and starting with verse 1. Psalm 61, beautiful Words from, from David here, it says this. Thinking about these times when, when things, I don't know what might be going on in you all's lives and the things that are on your hearts and the trials and the difficulties that you've been through or are going through or will go through. But I believe that God is calling us to trust him like we never have before. And I think that takes a knowledge and a relationship with him that we've never had before. And this is, uh, Psalm 61 says this, Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto you. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. This can be our experience, friends. This can be what we say when things are, you know, he, David here is overwhelmed. Sometimes life is a little overwhelming. There's, there's things going on that we can't make sense of and we don't know what to do with, but we can claim these beautiful promises in the word of God. And as David said, say, when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. And then he continues in verse three, for thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from mine enemy. And I will abide in the tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. And so we just see a beautiful picture of, of humility, of a childlike trust, and a running to dad, as it were, running to our Father in heaven when things are not making sense. At this time, I would like to call up uh, my friend as she plays a song as we think of these things about trusting God, about a trust in God that doesn't have to be connected with the circumstances. You know, I think of some passages that give me much hope and strength in life. Friends, God's promises are facts waiting to happen. But it takes us grasping those and saying, listen, this is truth. This is in your word. I can trust this. Some promises come to my mind right now. Jeremiah 29, 11, that God has a future and a hope. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 that nothing will come to us that we can't handle through his strength. When those trials come upon you and you feel like there's no way out, there is a way out because the word promises that nothing will come to us that we can't handle through the, through the strength of our Father in heaven. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on thy own understandings. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. Friends, these are promises that can carry us through the difficulties, that can give us that trust in God. And, and friends, I, wanna, I want to make an appeal to you all today, to myself. I believe we see that, that God is calling us. Do you, do you all see that God is calling us to a greater trust in God? To a trust that doesn't have to be connected with the circumstances? 
If, if that is the case, I want you to raise your hand. Is that something that you see? God is calling us to trust. And in that trust, the only way we can truly trust that way is by these things, friends. Spending time in the Word of God. Setting aside time to truly know our loving Savior. And it's easy to talk about. You know, we talk about devotions. You know, it's something that we all know is good. But seriously making time for devotions, for time in prayer, for time in fellowship. These are very important for our ability to trust in a loving God. You know, as I was driving, I'll just be transparent with you. As I was driving here today, one of my traditions on Sabbath morning is I uh, listen to Pillars of Our Faith. Are you familiar with that? The 3 ABN put out this CD, Pillars of Our Faith. Beautiful songs on that CD. And as I was listening through that, a conviction came on me. To have an appeal. I know appeal was already given here in the, bap- in the baptistry. For someone to give their heart and say, Listen, Jesus, I want to choose you and choose to trust you no matter what may come. And maybe this is for the first time, maybe this is for the second time, but this is the thing. I was, I was listening, I was thinking that thought, and the very next song that came up was, Take Me to the Water. Take Me to the Water to be baptized. So friends, I don't know what's on your heart. I don't know the things that might be going on your, in your life, but I believe there is someone here today that is feeling God tugging at their heart saying, will you trust me with giving me your entire life? Will you trust me with, with, with whatever may come in your life? Will you simply trust me? And will you give your heart to me? At this time, I want to call. If there's anybody that feels the call, God's tugging on the strings of their heart and saying, child, you can trust me. I'm a loving father. And you want to say, I want to be baptized. I want to choose to know and to love and to follow Jesus. If, if Jesus is tugging on your heart, if you're a young person, it could be a young person, it could be a middle-aged person, whoever you are, if God is speaking to you right now, I want to encourage you to, to come forward. Who cares if your friends or, or, you know, somebody's here that you're like, I don't want to do it in front of them or whatever. If God is calling you, I encourage you. Is there, is there one person here this morning that, that says, I want to, to give my heart to Jesus in baptism? Is there one person? Again, it might, it might be you're wondering, oh, should I really do this? Uh, you know, it's, it's a big commitment. It is, but it's worth it. The young man, Nathan, as he was, was in the waters, as he was baptized, the best decision he could ever make. I'm so proud of him. God is going to bless your life, Nathan. But is there somebody else here today that is, that is realizing the call on their heart and saying, Jesus, I need to make that full commitment. I need to say, Jesus, you are mine and I am yours and I'm going to trust you with my life. Is there one person here today? Is there one person that would say, Jesus, I want to choose you. Jesus is calling. Well, friends, maybe there's one that still wants to come. I want to give last, one last invitation. Is there someone that wants to give their heart to Jesus and say, Jesus, I want to choose you. I want to be baptized. I want to live to trust you. Is there one person here this morning that wants to decide to follow Jesus? Jesus is tugging. I don't know what might be on your heart, but I know that Jesus is calling. He's speaking to to someone here, and I just want to give, again, give that opportunity. If you want to say, Jesus, I want to choose you to just stand. You don't have to come to the front. You can just stand wherever you are. And say, Jesus, I want to give my heart to you. And maybe somebody's too shy. I don't know. But at this time, I want to pray for whoever it is 
that they would make that choice for Jesus. And, and the rest of you all, do you all see the importance of trusting God and want to fully trust him more and more each day? If that is, if that is truly your, your desire, I, I encourage you to raise your hand with me. Say, Jesus, I want to trust you. Jesus, I want to trust you. And let us pray as we close. Father in heaven, Lord, we come to you this morning thanking you that you're a, an amazing God that we can truly trust, that loves us, that cares for us, that isn't just a vending, that isn't a vending machine. You're a relational God, Lord. Teach us to trust you, Lord. And I want to pray for maybe that one or that two or whoever you're impressing on the heart that they should make that commitment for you, Lord. Maybe they were too shy. Maybe they're not sure uh, that they wanted to make that public right now, Lord, but impress their heart and encourage them, Lord, to make that stand, Lord, to stand for you. Be with each one here, Lord. Be with the families, be with the children, the grandparents, the grandkids, the moms and dads, and especially the fathers, Lord. Bless them this year. May they be an impact in their families. And we thank you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.